Well, let's get into the word. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. If you felt the presence of God so far in this service, would you say amen? Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Woo. You know, I don't know about you, but I want to be where God's presence is. And it's something about you. Yes, you, you individuals. It's something about you that brings the presence of God in here on Sunday morning. Don't you forget that. Be, be faithful in your attendance. We don't, we don't want to miss out on what God has for us. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. says, this is a faithful saying, for if we died with him. Say if. Yeah. Man, that's a big word. <laughs> it's just two letters, but it might be the largest word in all the English language. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. So he got on his hand, death and life. Which one you want? Well, I want both of them. I want to die to my old man, and I want to live to Christ. I don't want to, I don't want to live half in and half out. And if you're willing to die, you can live. And that's what they were demonstrating here this morning in baptism. They're saying, I'm willing to go under. I'm willing to go under to that old man and come up to the new man. That's good. My dad's got a Friend, I won't give you his name to protect the innocent, namely myself from lawsuit, but uh, we'll, we'll just call him Big Bob. You know, everybody's got one of those friends, right? Just over-the-top kind of guy. I've had my share in my life. My dad had one. We'll call him Big Bob. We ought to call him Big Muddy Bob because every time you saw him, he was muddy, I mean, all the way up to his knees and all on his hands, probably had it in his hair and stuff. He was a farmer, hunter, fisher, all that stuff. But it would be in the middle of a drought, and he'd come walking in the store or something, and he'd have mud all over. I'm like, well, how, I don't even know where he finds mud. But he, would, he was always muddy, big bob. And then I remember standing out in front of the Catholic church in Shaw, Mississippi, where, where he's from, where my, a lot of my family was from. And we were, I can't remember if it was a wedding or a funeral or some, some celebration <laughs> where we were all dressed up. And here comes Big Bob in a suit and tie. Nobody could believe it. They, they were like, you know how they go, oh, I didn't know you cleaned up so well. Look at you, you know. And everybody was excited. His friends was joking with him and making jokes and patting him on the back. They had no sooner stopped patting him on the back than he looks over and two of his kids, five, six years old, had found the only mud hole in the front yard of the church. And instead of, like most of us, y'all get out of there, he goes tromping in the mud in his suit and tie, then grabs those kids and comes walking out, and by the time he gets back to the front of the church, before he even gets in the church, he's muddy. <laughs> Do you know people like that? Second Peter chapter 2, verse 22 Peter says, but it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit. Maybe you've seen that before, too. And a sow, or a cow, I mean, not a, sow, a cow, but a pig, right? A pig, having washed, this pig was muddy but got all clean, returns to her wallowing in the mire. Now, I, when I read that scripture, I don't believe that he's talking about saved people. I believe he's talking about somebody that maybe gets cleaned up to go to church on Sunday, but really no change is happening on the inside. No salvation has happened. And so they can get cleaned up for a minute like that pig and put on their, you can dress a pig in a suit, right? Put a tie on him. But you let him go, right back to the mud. Why? Because a pig is a pig. And a sinner is a sinner. And a sinner is going to do what sinners do. And until there's a transformation on the inside and God sends his spirit in there, sinners are going to continue to sin, even if they come to church dressed up on Sunday. 
But we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about people who have been saved and still return to the mud. So I have entitled today's message, Mud Hound. I don't know if that's a real term. I just made it up, but it sounded appropriate for people who receive the free gift of salvation paid for in the blood of Jesus Christ, but go back to wallowing in the mire. Mudhounds are the saddest thing on earth because they were never meant to be. God never meant for any of us to get saved and to continue to live in the slop that we were living in before we got saved. He must be scratching his head. You mean, there they go again. The saddest thing on earth. They receive salvation, but they walk in none of it. Go under and baptize. And get baptized only to rise back up and go into the mud. Turn to Romans chapter 6. Verse 3. He's talking about baptism. Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? And let me stop there and say this. For there, to be, for there to be a resurrection, there must first be a death. For there, that's, that's the gist of my message. We could close right here. Are you listening? Y'all nodding, but y'all ain't saying amen. Amen. If you want a resurrection in your life, you're tired of living in the, in the squalor, then you got to die first. <laughs> you can't say, I want to live over here, but I want to live over here at the same time. You can't be in two places. you got to die to one to be resurrected into the other. It says we died with Christ. And buried in baptism. For we died and were, well, that's what it says, verse 4, look at there. We died and were buried with Christ with baptism, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father. Now we also may, say may. may. That's another big word in the English language. Huge. We also may live new lives. So who decides? <laughs> we, don't, we don't need a new set of church clothes. We need to be clothed in Christ. Because we all over the nation, we got people with some fancy clothes coming to church. But Monday through Saturday, what happened? They're knee deep in the mud. They're living like they were before they got saved. Don't be a mud hound. That was something that never created, God never created you to be a mud hound. Oh, Big Bob, I saw him in church before. If you ask him, I bet, he, I bet he'd say he was a Christian. But I heard all kinds of stories about Big Bob. <laughs> When it was Sunday. One time they said he was at this party drinking. He got so drunk they had some appetizers. They had some little dove breasts covered in bacon. With a toothpick holding on there. He was so drunk he was just chunking them in his mouth. Eating toothpick and all. Before the night was over they had to call the ambulance. To come get him. Take him to the emergency room. They ended up cutting out about half his new, test, his new intestines or something. Is it called new intestines? 
We believe in the old and the new intestines. <laughs> Amen. And that's what some of us do. We cut out about half the new intestines. <laughs> Another time he got so drunk, they, they were having a party at this new trailer they had bought and put at the lake, and, it, and uh, they put it up on stilts. You ever seen those things so it doesn't flood when the flood season comes? About 15 feet in the air, there's a trailer up there, and there's front stairs coming up to it. He was out there, and he got so drunk that he went out the back door to be like a country boy and do his business, and he forgot there was no stairs in the back and did a wily act. Coyote, what they fell about 15 feet and almost killed himself again. This guy was crazy. <laughs> Just, I don't know if all this happened before or after the crop duster incident. It would make more sense if it happened after. But being a farmer, one time he drove his pickup truck underneath the running propeller of a crop duster. It tore up the whole front of his truck, but worse than that, it hit him in the head. And it put a crease in his skull. I seen it. It made one of his eyes go like that. He went cross-eyed. He looked like Igor from Young Frankenstein. I mean, I don't know how it didn't kill him. His head was so hard it stopped the propeller on an airplane. And that's some of you, you mud hounds. Your head's too hard. <laughs> your hard heads. Give it up. Give it up. Come on. There's a new resurrected life for you to get involved in. Mud hounds live from one fiasco to the next. And if you find yourself needing a miracle after miracle, you're saved and you know you're going to heaven, but you're just living from miracle to miracle. You ain't doing something right. <laughs> because disciples live new lives. Maybe Christians act like that. But disciples live new lives. In Matthew 9, 17, Jesus tells a parable. He says, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. And I believe what, what he's talking about. The new wine is the Holy Spirit. And God's not going to put his Holy Spirit into you. If you're still living in the old wineskin. You're still living in the flesh. He's not going to fill the flesh with his Holy Spirit. And the power to overcome in this life. You understand? For the old wineskins would burst from the pressure. Spilling the wine and ruining the skin. See, that's why Jesus came to make us new so that we could be containers of the Holy Spirit. New wine is stored into new wine skins so that both are preserved. Does that make sense? Everybody following, tracking along with me? We're going to do a lot of scripture today. This is a teaching more than a preaching. So lock in, lock in. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you lock in. I would say on that point also, that new wineskins ain't supposed to be filled with Mad Dog 2020 wine. Come on, somebody know what I'm talking about? The Bible says don't be filled with wine where it's in excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be a new wineskin. Be filled with new wine and watch the resurrection begin to take place in your life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. And the new life, say new life, is begun. How many wants to live a new life? How many wants everything God has for them in the new intestines? <laughs> I do. You know, a, a caterpillar, once it turns into a butterfly, it doesn't crawl around anymore. It takes flight. It flutters around and, and captivates us with the beauty of God and the transformation that has taken place that God has given it. 
giving God glory. Today we got too many caterpillar Christians sitting on the pews. Whoa! Man, that's a hard statement right there. We got too many caterpillar Christians. They got big halos and wings and stuff, but they're full, they're muddy. <laughs> They're muddy. They've got so much mud on them they can't get off the ground. They want the power of the resurrection without the fellowship of the sufferings. <laughs> they want to follow him without taking up their cross. They want the kingdom of God and all of its power without dying to the American dream. They want theirs here and now, but they want it later too. In Hebrews 9.16... It says when someone leaves a will, you know, like say if I was to write out a, a will when I die, I want Angie to get this and my kids to get this. and I'm leaving all my guitars to Tony and so forth, you know. <coughs> Don't get excited, Tony. I'm just making an illustration. Now, when somebody leaves a will, it's necessary to prove that that person who made it is dead. So don't come chasing me down, Tony, saying, can I have it now? Can I have your guitars now? Because I got to die before that will goes into the effect. But you said I can have it. Not till I die. <laughs> the will goes into effect only after the person's death. While the person is, who made it is still alive, the will cannot be put into effect. And God... Gave us a new will and a new testament. And Jesus said that there be another way. But nevertheless, thy will be done. And he had to die to put it into effect. He died so that every promise in this new testament could be yours. Now you got to die so that it will happen in your life. You got to die to your old self so that you can walk in the newness of life. You have, Jesus died to provide. Disciples died of sin so that they may apprehend. John 12, 24, he says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. That's the way a seed works. It goes into the ground and it germinates. It dies. But because it's willing to die, it springs up eternal. It springs up fruitful. It springs up bigger than it would have ever been. But if it stays alone and refuses to die, it just sits there alone. Not fruitful. Not enjoying anything that God prepared for it. We all are guilty of digging up that old man. The only time my wife Angie calls me Pastor Guy is when I've dug up that old man. She goes, oh, Pastor Guy. I've just said something stupid or made a crass remark or something. Oh, Pastor Guy. She reminds me that I'm a pastor. That's good. You need to get a wife like that. <laughs> Romans 6, 5 says, Since we have been united with him in his death, we also will be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. Does sin have power and grip over you? Are you a slave to sin? And you're saying, how do I get out of this sin? I don't even like myself anymore. You have to crucify that old man with Christ. We're no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. You have power over sin, but you have to die to it. You have to be willing to die to it. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. You have a responsibility in this union with Christ. So we're going to talk about just for a moment how do we die to sin and live to righteousness.
How do we do it? Well, if Jesus has said in verse 10 of that same passage, Romans 6.10, for the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. You know, when he was hanging on your cross, he became your sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He became your sin, and so when he died, he was dying to that sin for you. He died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Likewise also, reckon yourselves. Now I didn't say wrecking yourselves. That's what I'm trying to get you to stop doing. Stop wrecking yourself. But reckon yourself. That means see yourself. Say see yourself. You got to begin to see yourself different. It says, see yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You got to change your mentality. You can't be sin minded all the time. Whatever you think about and whatever you reflect on, whatever you call yourself, that's what you are. You say, I'm just an old sinner. Thank goodness for God's grace. No, you were an old sinner, but you were saved by grace. You're not an old sinner anymore. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's a way of reckoning yourself. Reckon yourself as a, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. See yourself that way. As long as you keep giving yourself the excuse, well, I'm just an old sinner. I, what are you going to do? Well, I'm a sinner. I must... It must be okay for me to sin every now and then. It's the way we're seeing ourselves. Colossians 2.12 says we were buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith. You say, I don't, I don't see myself as righteous. I don't see, because you're looking in the natural. But faith says you are. The Bible says you are, then you are. You through faith. In the working of God who raised him from the dead. It's faith in him and not faith in you. Okay, so you sin every now and then. Well, get your eyes off of you and get your eyes on Jesus. The author and the finisher of your faith. He's the one that's going to carry it to completion. He's the one that's going to finish the good work he started in you. Get your eyes on Jesus. Reckon yourself that I'm, I'm a masterpiece of the Lord. He has a plan for my life. He's given me power over sin. I died to all that. I'm alive to Christ Jesus. Oh, <laughs> Say wrecking yourself. <laughs> so you stop wrecking yourself. <laughs> so see yourself different. Have faith in what God is doing in you. And thirdly. Faith worketh by love. It was God's love that died on that cross for you. His name was Jesus. And it will only be your love for him that will be able to put sin to death in your life. There was a woman caught in the act of adultery thrown at his feet. She was guilty. She was a sinner. And all the religious came and started hurling accusations and saying the, the law says that we should stone her. And it did. The law did say that. But thank God that God's mercy is stronger than the judgment against us. Thank God for the cross of Jesus Christ and the blood that covers our sins. Thank God for the love that covers us. Man, we can stop right there and just have a party. Thank you, Jesus, that you're not counting my sins against me. Thank you, Jesus, I've been redeemed. I've been made new in the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
He run them guys off. Talking about you without sin cast the first stone. Because we all down here struggling. I know that. I'm not saying everybody's going to be perfect. He ran them off. He says, where are your accusers? She said, they're gone. He said, well, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Do you think she left there and went back to that adulterous bed? I'm not sure. Some people believe that was Mary Magdalene that, came, that was cast at his feet. Some people say maybe not. But either way, I, I don't think whoever this woman was, that she didn't go back into that life of sin. She had met love face to face. She had received his mercy face to face. And did she stop sinning because the law told her to stop sinning? Did she say, well, you know, them guys, them Pharisees were right. The law does sin. It was the law trying to stone her. Some of us are still trying to keep the law. But Jesus fulfilled the law and gave us the new law to love. We're, some of us are so law-minded. We're trying to, through willpower, be a good person. It don't work like that. She didn't become all God called her to be because she, she was, by her own strength, going to keep the law. The law was there as our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ because we couldn't keep the law. We understood we needed a Savior. Amen. Stop being law-minded. If you will love Jesus, you will come out of your sin. He will bring you out. It's in the relationship. Do you want to walk in your works or do you want to walk by grace? How do you want to live your life? How does Jesus want you to live your life? Does he want you to be so proud of your performance? Or does he want your heart just to want to please him? It's because our love for Jesus Christ that makes us new. Allows us to keep that old man dead. To walk in the newness of life. Galatians 2.19 Paul says, When I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. The woman caught in adultery said they wanted to stone me. The law condemns. John 3, 17 says the Son of God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through Him the world might be saved. Yes. He's trying to show us a better way. Some of us are so condemned because we try and we try. But we're doing it all backwards. We, it's, we've based it on us. Some people are not even really saved because they base their salvation on themselves and not on the cross. Everything is in Jesus, do you understand? If we get our focus on Jesus, He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the one that will bring it to completion. I tried to keep the law. It condemned me. So I died to the law. That might rock some of your theology right there. The Apostle Paul said, I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all its requirements so that I might live for God. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it is Christ that lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's not about rules and regulations. It's about relationship. You live this new life in a new relationship. I mean, the whole book about Galatians is talking about people who got saved and then want to go back to try to show how good they, do, they are and how much they deserve through their works, the grace of God. The moment you begin to work for the grace of God, it ce ceases to be grace. Let your love for Christ dictate your behavior. 
dictate your, your future, your, your longings, your desires. Our main thing in this life as Christians is to know Him, that I may know Him and then experience the power of His resurrection. That I may know Him. That old Big Bob. That guy. This is so many stories. One time he was going duck hunting on a cold January morning before sunup. He was in a boat. And he had his partner in the boat with him. A whole boat full of duck decoys and everything. And I know because my daddy told me the story. He was in his boat behind him with his partner and his decoys. And they were going through driving down the lake at night. And the water was up so high, a cable that used to go across, you know, up high above the water was now boat level, and they didn't know it. And through the dark, uh, Big Bob hit that cable, and it stopped the boat just dead in its tracks going across the lake. Well, the one guy fell down to the bottom of the boat, but Big Bob got cast out of the boat, but not before he busted his head on the front of the boat and went over into the cold, frigid water with big old heavy duck waders boots on. And as he was about to sink to the bottom, he was giving his last gas trying to get to the surface with them big boots like concrete weighing him down. His partner reached down and grabbed him by the hand and got his hand up to the edge of the boat, got both his hands up, but he was too heavy to get in the boat. And so my dad pulled his boat up beside and they held on to it and they dr drug him to the shore where he got out on the shore, head bleeding, needing stitches, soaking wet, shivering, steam coming off of him. My dad says, come on, let's get you to the emergency room. He goes, oh, no, this ain't nothing. I'm going to hunt. He said, y'all go and put the decoys out. I'm going to start a fire and warm my clothes up. Y'all come back and get me in about 30 minutes. They left him there. He started a fire Got his clothes at least to the damp stage. They came back and got him. He shivered all day hunting in that, in that duck boat. Hard headed. A propeller couldn't crease his skull good. He wouldn't give up. And some of you are like that. I know I fall into that category at times where I'm trying to perform for God. And I keep trying. And I keep failing. And every time I make it about me. I'm going back to the mud. I'm living like a mud hound. It's all the work of God's spirit. He's the one who raised Jesus from the dead. And he's the one that will raise you from the dead. Romans 8, 11 says, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Thank you, Lord. Unless, of course, you're one of those stubborn people who do always resist the Holy Ghost. No, no. You'll never walk in the newness of life like that. Jesus died to make you available for the Holy Spirit, to make you a container to receive the Holy Spirit. That's the whole purpose. To get the Spirit of God back in you. And now you're going to want Christ. You want heaven. But you don't want the filling of the Holy Spirit. Be real. You're missing the point. The Spirit of God who raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead. He will give life to your mortal bodies. By the same Spirit. Holy Spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. You don't have to do it anymore. You have a choice. Every day I can walk in the spirit or I can dig up that old man and walk in the flesh. But you don't have to do it. For if you live by its dictates, the old sinful man, you will die. But through, if through the power of the Spirit you put to death, there we go again, to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are who? Are you led by the Spirit of God?
You know, a mud hound will never reflect God's glory. You know, it's like the sun and the moon. The, the sun has the glory. And the moon just reflects the glory of the sun. That's what lights up the night. We're down here in the night. And we're supposed to reflect the sun's glory to this earth that we live in. But like a mirror, we're supposed to reflect his brightness. But if mud is all over our mirror, what's going to happen? We're not reflecting God's glory. And mud hounds do not reflect the glory of God. They're the reason most people won't get saved and come to church because it's church is full of mud hounds. Old Big Bob, they said one time, was driving down a gravel road in that old beat up truck that got hit by the propeller. And he had his little mud puppy in the seat next to him. His son, he was seven, eight years old at the time. He went around a corner. And the door just flung open on that old beat-up truck. <laughs> Neither one of them was wearing a seatbelt. And the sun got slung out, slung across the gravel road into the ditch. They said, oh, Big Bob stopped the truck, went over there, yanked the boy up, dusted him off, threw him back in the truck, and got in and drove off. Mud hounds will always raise mud puppies. You want to sit up here and tell your children how they are to follow the Lord, but you're not following the Lord? You think they're, that's going to make them want to follow the Lord? They're not. They're going to be mud hounds too. Mud hounds raise mud puppies. And God is calling us to change the generational curses in our life. He's calling us to raise a new generation that trust in the grace and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and understand their purpose in this place. And then there's one thing I want to close with. Well, let me recap. So far we've learned that we must experience a resurrection, but to experience a resurrection, you've got to experience death to self. We, we have to see ourselves. We have to reckon ourselves as new creations in Christ Jesus. We live by faith and not by willpower. It is Christ's work of sanctification in your life. He's the one doing the work. You just stay in close relationship. You just stay on the potter's wheel. He's the captain of your sanctification. So develop your relationship with him because it's only by love for him that you will be able to keep that lid on that casket of your old man down. I know that when I think about him dying on that cross for me and I'm say, okay, well, I'm going to go sin now. No, I can't do it. Maybe you're that callous. But his love has changed me. So I live by his Holy Spirit. I welcome his Holy Spirit to lead and guide my life. I want to be filled with that life-giving presence that drives out the darkness. And lastly, the last thing I want to say is we've got to be heavenly-minded. We've got to think about the big picture. What are you investing in? The here and now or all of eternity? You know, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He lived in the palace in Egypt. He was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. He had everything that this world could possibly offer to a young man. Instead, he decided, nope, I'm an Israelite. In Hebrews 11.25, he chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of joining the fleeting pleasures of sin. He made a decision. He said, I'm going to invest in the eternal. I'm going to be heavenly minded. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt. <coughs> For he was looking ahead to his great reward. Say heavenly minded.
Colossians 3, 1 says, If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ is your life who appears, then you will appear with him in glory. If you will let his glory shine here, then you will have his glory in heaven. But if you're a mud hound here and uh, your life just stays undignified and un, un fruitful, yeah, you're, you're not being a mirror for his glory down here. Don't expect his glory in heaven. But when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will see his glory in heaven. You will share his glory in heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh my goodness. That's what I want. I want to be, I'm heavenly minded. I'm, a, I'm sorry, I'm a big picture person. I'm thinking, of, you know, my, I'm thinking long term investments. I'm not investing in something that's going to one day uh, somebody else is going to own. They're going to get my stuff when I'm gone, you know. I'm not setting up permanent camp down here. I'm a sojourner through this earth. I got my eyes on heaven. And I'm not going to live like a mud puppy, like a mud hound. I want to see the glory of God. I want to see the glory of God. I want to live in the glory of God. 